looks like it's a familiar screen to everybody. Suppose you want to correct a misspelling from a corrupted text, like what Google search engine is doing every day. Or imagine that you have scanned an image and you want to remove noise that are injected from a scanner. These problems can be formulated in terms of a more general framework called discrete denoising, which is where you want to clean up a discrete data that are corrupted by discrete noise. A main goal of this problem is to extract clean or relevant information from noisy observation, and it has been one of the central interests of many statisticians, computer scientists, or information theorists. Hello, everyone. My name is Taesun Moon, and I'm from Stanford University. Today, I'm going to introduce a new take on this discrete denoising problem and present a scheme that will work universally well on any kinds of this discrete denoising problem and which will become even powerful when the source or the signal is time-varying or space-varying. And this is a joint work with my advisor, Professor Zaki Weisman at Stanford. My talk consists of three parts, background, motivation, and main results. So discrete denoising problem is essentially an estimation problem. In this problem, you have a discrete source, which I denote as x1 through xn and it gets corrupted by discrete noise and results in the noisy sequence Z1 through Zn. There is a discrete denoiser which observes this noisy sequence and it tries to estimate or reconstruct the source by X1 hat through Xn hat. By discrete, I mean the, val the values that X, Z, and X hats are taken in the finite alphabet, for example, English text in 26 alphabets, or binary signal, two alphabets. Given this setup, the goal of discrete denoising problem is to choose x1 hat through xn hat as close as possible to the source x1 through xn based on the entire noisy sequence z1 through zn. I'll specify more precisely what I mean by this as close as possible as I go along. A binary version of this discrete denoising problem is as follows. xn is a clean binary bit stream like this. Now suppose there's a noise which flips bit with some probability 0.1. Now, observing this noisy sequence, a denoiser tries to reconstruct xn by x hat n. Maybe it corrected some error, but since it doesn't know which bit is noisy and which bit is clean, it may also inject some errors like this. But hopefully, it reduced, it reduced the error from the noise, and the performance of the denoiser is measured by, in this case, bit error rate, which is the number of errors divided by the sequence length n. So again, the goal is, given noisy sequence, how would you choose x hat n to minimize this bit error rate? Now, life is easy if a denoiser knows both about the source and the noise. For example, in the text correction problem, it's a if a text corrector knows that the text is coming from English and he knows how the tape typo is made, then probably he will soon figure out this k <coughs> in this gook is a noisy symbol and k replaced with l is much probable word in English. Another example, <coughs> suppose now source is a binary bit, but it's coming from binary Markov chain with transition probability p. Okay. And then suppose it knows that the noise flips bits independently with some probability delta. The resulting noisy sequence in this case is called the hidden Markov process, and there exists a simple optimum scheme called four-backer recursion which can minimize the bit error rate for estimating this bit stream in this case. So this setting of known so source model and noise model and trying to do the optimal thing with respect to this model is called the Bayesian setting. However, in real life, life is not that easy because we often don't know what the source is. For example, in the binary bit, ca bit stream case, we can have any binary bit stream like this but we don't know where it's coming from. Then, even though we know what the noise is and noise probability delta is, it's not clear what scheme we should apply to minimize the bit error rate in estimating this bit stream. Another example is in, is in image denoising. Suppose the possible clean image source can vary from Einstein or some scan text or monkey or a LANA image. Again, even though you know what the noise model is, since these images have different characteristics for each, from each noise, so different denoiser will do better for each, each 
each images. So it's not clear what kind of denoiser we should employ if we don't know what the underlying image is. So these kind of scenarios happen often in real life because the source model that we take may be wrong or the source may not have any, any probabilistic model. For example, images, it's not coming from any probabilistic model, it's just an image. Or the model that we assume may be changing over time. In fact, our everyday life is also like this. The world is full of noise, and we try to extract something from that noisy world. But we don't know what that something is. So the name of the game throughout this talk is that we try to learn the source by knowing the noise. More specifically, I assume that the source is unknown. Okay? But I assume that the noise mechanism is known to the denoiser. And, this is, and, and I focus the noise mechanism to be the case for the memoryless channel. By memoryless, I mean the noise components are independent over time. Now, for this memoryless channel, it's completely characterized by this channel transition matrix pi, whose x zth element stands for the conditional probability of the noisy symbol taking value z, given that the clean symbol was x. The goodness of denoising is measured by given loss function lambda. And the simplest example of this loss function is the Hamming loss, where it takes value 1 if the reconstruction is different from the source and 0 otherwise. So if we apply this Hamming loss to the bit binary bit case, it's just counting the number of errors. So given this setup, we ask a question, we ask a question can we still denoise as well as if we know the source distribution, even though we don't know anything about the source? So with this setup and this question, this is, this is called the universal setting. Now throughout this talk, I'll focus on the universal discrete denoising problem, and I'll present that we have devised a new universal discrete denoiser called the stud algorithm. But before I explain what stud is and how it works, I'll first have to briefly overview the previously developed scheme called the DUDE. DUDE, which stands for discrete universal denoiser, is the first universal discrete denoiser that is devised in a recent paper by Weizmann et al. I'll show that this DUDE is tailored for stationary sources, and then I'll devise a new universal discrete denoiser which generalizes this DUDE to a more general case where the source is non-stationary. So having this rough roadmap in mind, let's see what DUDE is and how it works. Okay. So DUDE is the first universal discrete denoiser, and it's a pretty intuitive scheme. For each location t that it wants to denoise, it first fixes the window size to k, and then at each location it looks at the left k and right k of this symbol. Okay. This left and right k symbols are called the context of this noisy symbol zt. And once it identifies what, what is the context of that symbol, it tries to search over the whole noisy data and finds the places where it has the same context as this point. Okay. And then it counts what kind of symbols occur how many, for how many times at this location for the p position that has the same context. And once getting this count, it applies some simple rule which depends on the channel matrix pi, the, the knowledge of the channel, and the loss function, and this count vector, and this noisy symbol at time t. So I won't go into the detail of what kind of simple rule it's employing, but let's look at an example and see how it works. Yes. One. So all occurrences of letters with the same context, I'm just see if I understand them. Yeah. Letters meaning ZT, z, z, occurrences of ZT yeah. with those contexts L1 to LK, R1 to RK. Yeah. So now those are going to be noisy as well. Right? Yes, yes, exactly. The, the context. Exactly, yeah. yeah. These are noisy contexts, but it just tries to search over the whole noisy data where it has the same context and counts like what kind of symbol occurs at the middle point and how many times it occurs. Okay. So let's look at an example. Suppose we have some noisy list text like this, and let's say it gets corrupted, and dude observes this noisy text. Okay? And suppose it gets interested in this letter M here. Okay? It doesn't know whether this is a noisy symbol or a clean symbol, but it tries to come up with the reconstruction value for this letter M. So dude with window size 2, it looks at the left 2 and right 2 around this M, 
and it tries to search over the whole document where this H, so in this case is H-E-R-E, -E, and searches over the whole document and see how many times this pattern occurs. And then it counts what symbol occur at this middle point. Here it's space, it's an O, and it's I here. Okay? So once you search over all this, doc all this document, you get this, the dude count, gets this count vector that, uh, that stores what kind of letter occurs how many times. So I has occurred once, M once, O, fourth, and space has five times. So very simple scheme may just go with the majority vote in this case, but dude is doing some, something more. Basically, based on his knowledge on the channel, how noisy it is, and based on how the loss is measured, it, it make a decision on how much it's going to believe on this, this count vector. Okay? So one thing I would like to note here is, do, if you see this simple rule, this rule is going to be only depend on this H-E-R-M-R-E, -E, these five characters, because pi and lambda is fixed throughout the whole sequence. So whenever dude sees these five characters, it's going to employ the same decision for this, this letter M here. Okay? So this kind of characteristic suggests that dude is a sliding window denoiser. So by sliding window denoiser, I mean as follows. A kth order sliding window denoiser is defined by a mapping or function called SK, which maps noisy 2k plus 1 tuple to the reconstruction symbol. So basically what, it's, what sliding window denoisers are doing is at each location t, it looks at the noisy 2k plus 1 tuple centered around this time t. And by observing this noisy sequence, it comes up with reconstruction by employing this SK rule. And it's, it slides over this noisy, noisy sequence like this. So if it sees different, uh, different context, different symbols, then it comes up with a different reconstruction and so on. But the important thing is, if it sees the same noisy uh, symbols like this as the red symbol, it comes up with the same reconstruction value and so on. So, so the important thing about the sliding window denoiser is this rule SK is fixed over the whole noisy sequence. Now this class includes many practical denoisers including medium filters and morphological filters and so on. And we have just seen that dude is also a member of this class of sliding window denoiser with window size k. We also see, see that dude is a linear complexity algorithm because it just needs to search over the whole document once and go back and do the denoising. Okay, okay so now let's see how dude works for the real noisy data. Suppose we have a noise, noisy text like this, which is noisy version of Don Quixote novel, which had, which had 21 errors originally. Now, if you run this dude algorithm on this noisy text, the error reduces to 7. It corrects almost 66% corrects of errors. This is a pretty good result because dude does not know whether these texts are English. It doesn't know anything about this source. It's not a dictionary-based scheme, but it, er it corrects error up to 7 errors. Also, let's look at this binary example. Suppose now our source is coming from binary Markov chain with transition probability 0.1 and the sequence length is 10 to the 6. Now let's say noise flips this bit independently with some probability 0.1. The resulting noisy sequence is again called the hidden Markov process and we can employ the four backer recursion which knows completely about this p and the sequence length n and this delta to get the optimal bit error rate. Now the dude that does not know what the source is, if we, we are interested in how it will work for this noisy sequence if we employ the dude. And if we run the example, as you can see in this plot, where the x-axis is the window size that dude is employing, and the y-axis is the relative bit error rate to the channel error rate, delta. So if you see this plot, if we increase the window size of the, window size of the dude, the performance is attaining the base optimal performance if you increase, increase the window size of the dude. We also see that the window size k is some kind of design parameter for given sequence length n because we increase the window size too much, the performance is a little bit degrading. So dude is a simple algorithm and it works well in, in these examples. But the original paper by Weizmann et al they also show that it, it achieves the optimal performances 
for stationary sources. The performance of a denoiser is measured by this per symbol loss, denoted as L, which is just normalize some of the losses that this denoiser is incurring at each time t. So given this performance measure, the original Wiseman et al. paper show that if the window size of the, of the dude increases with logarithmically with sequence length n, then what they show is for any stationary underlying source process x, the difference between the expected per symbol loss of dude and the best expected per symbol loss is going to zero as the sequence length increases. So this performance is the best performance of the denoiser, which is the base optimal performance, match it to this stationary process x, but dude, which does not know what the source is and does not know about the source probability law, they show that it attains the base optimal performance. They show even stronger result that for all underlying source sequence x, now this is a, it's not a random source sequence, it's an individual source sequence, they show that without expectation, the per symbol loss of the dude is attaining the value of dk, where dk is the performance of a genie who knows both the underlying source and the noisy sequence and can choose the best sliding window denoiser for that source, source and noisy sequence pair. So this theorem shows that as sequence length increases, the performance of the dude is attaining the performance of the best sliding window denoiser for that source sequence and the noisy sequence pair regardless of what the source sequence may be. And this is a with probability one result, meaning that for almost every noisy, noisy sequence realization, this result holds. Yes? So K over there yes. in, that, in that result yes. is, the, is the K selected yes. over yes. there. So it's the uh, same but, order. But it could yes. be, conceivably, there could be a better K, right? So DK is not necessarily the optimal sliding wind in decoder for, uh, for, that, that, for that particular individual sequence, right? That's, that's true, that's true, but this, what this result is saying is that for same order, same window size k, dude is attaining the best performance with the same order of the sliding window thing. Do they have any results as what the, the regret is for if you, if you uh, against the, so it would be arbitrarily bad, right? Yeah, yeah. so to yeah. choosing the best k for given n is, yeah. is a hard problem right. to choose. But sti sti still this result shows that for, for the class of same window size sliding window denoiser, dude is attaining the performance of the best guy in this set for given source and noisy sequence pair with probability one. So, so can you please clarify your choice of k there, kn? Yeah, so the K is a window size that dude is employing, right? right? And if we increase the window, for given sequence length N, if we set the window size kind of grow like logarithmically in sequence length N, and then we're looking at the sequence of problems for each N, as N, in, N grows, we choose the window size grow, growing with N like this, and that sequence of problems shows the property that this holds. Mm -hmm. And Z is the... Uh Z is the noisy. Vocabulary size. I'm sorry? Z is the vocabulary size for the symbols that yes, the source yes, emits. Yes. Z is the uh, alphabet size of the noisy, noisy symbol. Noisy sequence. So does that mean that um, the, so, the higher the vocabulary size, the better dude will do? Um, not really, because uh, this, actually, the, I just suppressed the convergence rate of this, this limit because there is also a result of the uh, how fast it goes to zero. And it also depends on the, window, the alphabet size of the noisy sequence. And if alphabet size is big, then it's getting slow, slow convergence. But, no, yeah. I meant, so sorry, I, I was unclear. So you, we will need a shorter window for yeah. larger vocabulary sizes. Yes, yes. That seems That's to be true. Yeah, because if, if the vocabulary size is large, then you know, the data, the context, the type of context is going to be, you know, sparse if we increase the window size too big. So that's the way how there's a trade-off. Very interesting. Between, yeah. Okay. Okay, so we have seen dude is a simple algorithm, works well, and has some strong performance guarantees. Now, is this the end of the story? 
Let's look at one more example. Suppose again we have a binary sequence like this. And now, let's say, it's coming from binary Markov chain, but this transition probability shifts from 0.01 to 0.2 at the midpoint of the sequence. Now this source is not a stationary source. It's a non-stationary or it's a piecewise stationary source. And let's say the, the, the noise also flips bit with 0.1 independently over each bit. Again, if the four back or recursion, the, the optimal scheme for hidden Markov processes, it knows what the parameters is, where it changes, and from what parameter to what parameter, then we can employ the four back or recursion separately on each stationary box and get the optimal bit error rate. The question is, can dude still achieve this optimal bit error rate in this case? The answer is no. So even though we increase the window size, the bit error rate of the dude does not attain this base optimal performance. So this example shows that dude has a limitation for time varying or space varying sources. This is due to the fact that dude is imp always employing the same rule throughout the whole noisy sequence. For example, it only cared how many times this HEMRE occurred in this noisy text, but it didn't care when, where or when it, they occur. So dude is tailored for stationary sources. However, in practice, many sources are time varying or space varying. Suppose you have a text where at some part it's written in English and then translated to Spanish or German. Or suppose you have a voice signal where some part is quiet and some part is, 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 is loud. Or let's say you have an image where some part you have only, you have more text and some part you have some different texture of images. Therefore, we ask a key main question of this talk saying, can we do better than dude for when this source varies? More specifically, can we perform as if we know the source and we know the change points if the source varies? And if we can do it, can we do it efficiently? So these two are the main questions that I'm asking. So we have seen the background and motivation for the main results. So is there any questions up to this point? Okay, now I'm going to move on to the most important part of this talk, the main result. Basically, I want to say, answer this, the question, the previously asked question, and say that the new algorithm stud shifting universal denoiser can do better than dude for varying sources. We can answer these two questions affirmatively. Can we perform as if we know the source, including the change point? Yes, stud can do it as if it knows source and where it changes. And stud is a linear, simple complexity algorithm, so we can do it efficiently. The main point that I'll make in this section is stud can still universally attain the optimum denoising performance, provided that it is at all attainable. I'll again specify what this means as I go along. So to see how we can devise the new algorithm stud and how it works, let's take a closer look at the simple binary example. Again, we have a binary sequence and the bits are flipped with probability delta independently. Let's suppose dude with window size three has decided as follows. Suppose it decided whenever it sees this noisy bit tuple, seven bit tuples like this, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Suppose it has decided the reconstruction value for this zero is zero. And let's say it has, it has decided the reconstruction value for one is one with the same left and right context. So from this decision, basically, we can say that this left and right context has defined a mapping, say what you see mapping for this middle symbol, right? So whenever, for this left and right context, whenever dude sees zero, it will come up with zero. And whenever it sees one, it will come up with one, just, just saying what it sees, okay? And since dude is a sliding window denoiser, it will always employ the same, this single letter mapping, say what you see mapping for this middle position, wherever it sees. So the single letter mappings I mean by it, what I mean by single letter mapping is, it's a mapping that takes one noisy symbol, the single noisy symbol, and comes up with single reconstruction value. And in binary case, there are only four single letter mappings we can see. First one is a saying what you see mapping, or flipping what you see, or always saying zero, or always saying one. I didn't go into the detail of the 
simple rule of the dude, but I can say a little bit more for this binary case. Essentially, what dude is doing is it looks at this left and position where it has the same left and right context, and it counts how many zeros and ones occur at this middle point. And what it's doing is if it sees similar numbers of zeros and ones, it gets confused, and it's just saying, it's just employing say what you see mapping. But if it sees much more zeros than ones, it will employ always say zero mapping for that disposition, and vice versa. And the, and the threshold deciding the level of similar number or much more will be depend, depending on the noise level, noise probability delta. So for, for this example, probably dude has seen similar numbers of zeros and ones for this left and right context, so it employed saying what you see mapping. Now let's look even more closer to this example. Suppose now zeros and ones at this location had, so the subsequence points of the noise sequence were looked like this. So there are similar numbers of zeros and ones, so probably, so from this, dude has, dude may employ the saying what you see mapping for this position. But if you see even closer, there are much more zeros here and much more ones here. So probably the underlying source which results in this noisy sequence have be almost zero here and almost one here. So if you can split this and employ this always saying zero mapping for this position and always saying one for this position, it may be helpful in reducing the overall loss. So generally, if this single letter mappings that we are employing for each context can switch, or it has some freedom to shift along the sequence, they can attain smaller loss, right? But the question is again, how can we decide when to shift to what mapping? Because remember, this is a noisy sequence, and we don't know exactly about the underlying source, because we don't see what is the under underlying source sequence exactly. So ideally, if we can shift this single error, this mappings every point of time to the correct mapping, that will be the best thing to do. But this is equivalent to knowing the underlying sequence perfectly, exactly, which is an impossible thing to do. Therefore, we set some limit on the number of these shifts that we allow, and we call that number as M. And then we consider a set or class called SMN, which is a class of all possible the single letter mappings that allow at most m shifts for the sequence length n. Okay? So for example, let's say this is a noisy sequence of length n. You can think of this as the subsequence points that have the same context. So for this noisy sequence, let's suppose at this part, the mapping that we, that we employ is the saying what you see mapping. And let's say this part is always saying zero mapping. Here always saying one or saying what you see mapping. And this combination have shifted three times, and this so this combination is a member of S3N. Now we realize that the size of this class or size of this set is growing exponentially in both N and M, because there are total N choose M possible cases where to decide where to shift, and for each po point of shifting time, it can shift from whatever mapping to whatever mapping. And from the previous slide, the question of deciding when to shift to what mapping for m times is equivalent to selecting the best combination in this set. Okay. So having this set up, we now devise the key main tool in devising our new scheme. Let's consider now the simplest example. Now we have, suppose, only one source symbol, x, the single letter setting, and let's say it gets corrupted by channel, the noise, and then there's a noisy, noisy symbol, Z. Now, the noiser observes this C, and it, suppose it employs a single letter mapping, which takes this C and comes up with the reconstruction value X hat. Now, lambda of X and SC is a loss that this denoiser is incurring between the clean source symbol X and the reconstruction. But the problem is, this loss is not observable to the denoiser because it doesn't know what the underlying source symbol is. However, from the knowledge of this channel, the noise matrix pi, we can devise a new function called L, which is a function of noisy symbol and this mapping, such that it has a property 
that the expectation of this L is the same as the expectation of the true loss. In other words, we can devise a function L, which is an, we can always devise a function L for given noisy channel pi, such that it is an unbiased estimate of the true loss, lambda. We can also interpret this L as another loss function between noisy symbol Z and the mapping that the noiser is choosing. So this is a new loss function, but all of a sudden now, we can observe this value of the loss because Z is what you're observing and S is what you're choosing. So given this key tool, now we can define our new algorithm, the stud algorithm. So what it's doing is, for each context C, for example, this binary context, stud finds the location that has the same context as this C, just like in the dude, and then it adds up the estimated losses incurred by this noisy symbol at those location and the, the mapping that is employed for that location. Then it tries to minimize the sum over this set, where you only allow these single error mappings to, to shift up to m times. It defines the, the minimizer of this sum as s hat. Ideally, the best combination, the best minimizer that we would, we would like to get would be the one that is minimizing this true loss, because this is the performance that we are shooting for. But again, since we don't know what this true loss is, since we don't know what x is, we just replace this lambda with this new loss, L. Once we get this combination, now stud applies those combination of single lateral mappings for each of those locations. So this definition looks pretty simple. But again, the question is, how can we get this this combination of single lateral mappings that minimizes this over this set efficiently. Because as we saw, the size of this set is growing exponentially in sequence length n and the number of shifts that we allow. So your, your shift times are different for every different context? Yes, it can, it can be, it can have a freedom to shift for each, we, we employ this thing for every, every context in parallel. Is that, is that useful or would it be better to constrain the, the context the, the shift, shift points essentially shift, shift. correspond to changes in the source model, right? See, yeah. So but for every I mean, context, you're letting them do different things. Yeah, Does but that, if, if, the real so if the real source shifts, at the, at the, you know, if the real source is shifting, but then this change point is going to be occur in the similar part because, I mean, this, this gives more freedom to choose where to, where to shift, so it can shift at the same time. But as we, you can see in the, in the theoretical result, this is good enough for getting our result. So the bottom line is how can we get this best combination efficiently? And the bottom line is we can employ this stud algorithm with a simple two-pass algorithm. So to see how we can devise it, let's again look at the binary example and this uh, binary noise case. Again, I restate the problem. How can we find the best combination of single letter mapping that minimizes this sum of estimated losses incurred by these noisy symbols and these mappings. Recall that for binary cases, there are only four possible single letter mappings, always saying zero, always saying one, saying what you see, and flipping what you see. To solve this problem, basically we have to allocate a matrix of dimension m by four, where m is the number of shifts and four is the number of single letter mappings for each time point t. Once we assign this matrix, during the first pass of this algorithm, it scans the noisy symbol, what they are, and while scanning, it up updates this matrix by simple dynamic programming. Once it updates all the matrix all the way up to time n, the, the last sequence, now it can extract the best combination of single letter mappings by doing simple backward recursion. So this is a rough skeleton of the algorithm, and let's see how it works more in detail. So the goal was, again, to minimize this sum of estimated losses from time 1 to n. But now, what is mt? mt is a matrix that stores, stores the minimum sum of estimated losses up to time t, not to the n, but up to that time t. And for example, this ith row of this matrix and say what you see column, this element is defined to be the minimum sum of estimated losses from time 1 to t, but it has some more constraint, attain the minimum attained by combination of mappings that allow at most i shifts, this i shifts, 
until time t. And the last mapping you're employing is the saying what you see mapping. So this element, each of these elements of matrix is defined to be this way. And once you define matrix with this, now during the first pass, we update this matrix as we go along. So let's suppose at time t, the algorithm tries to get the value of this, this element, the minimum sum, up to time t by allowing i shifts and last mapping is saying what you see. We soon realize that there are only two possible cases to get to this minimum value. First one is that this i shift, the last shift that we allow, has occurred at this time t. So until previous time points, only i minus 1 shift has occurred, and the i shift has occurred at time t. Then for that case, it only needs to look at mt minus 1, the matrix at the previous time, and look at the i minus 1th row, and find the minimum among these. Once you find it, you add the loss that is incurred at time t by employing this, this rule. And another case is this i shift has occurred sometime before time t. So it already occurred. And in that case, you just need to add this value plus the loss that is incurring at time t. So basically, to get this element, you just need to compare this row and this value at the previous time point matrix, find the minimum, and add the loss that is incurring, the estimated loss incurring for employing this rule. And we can update each element of the matrix by the same way. Now once you reach the end point of the sequence, if you look at the last matrix and look at the last row, mth row, and if you find the minimum among these values, then by definition, that minimum value is the minimum sum of estimated losses until time n by allowing at most m shifts of these mappings. Okay? If you find the, arg the minimum argument of this, this value, then that mapping is the one that, that the study is employing for time n. Once it gets that mapping, now it peels off the optimal path to get this minimum value by again doing the backward recursion and gets the optimal path of the mappings and employ that and do the denoising for those time points. So, as we just have seen, the complexity of this algorithm is linear in both sequence length n and the number of shifts m. So it's a simple, practical algorithm to employ. So to summarize our new algorithm stud, for each location t, as similarly as in the dude, it first fixes the window size equal to k, and then it, fix, it sets the number of shifts m. So we have another parameter just the number of shifts that we allow. And then again, it searches for the left and right context. And look at the all positions that have the same context. And for those positions, employ this previous algorithm to get this best combination of mappings that minimizes this estimated losses, sum of estimated losses. And once you get th that mapping, just so simply merely employ those mappings for each of these points. We can also show that if we set this m equal to 0, this stud coincides with the original dude algorithm. So we have generalized the dude algorithm, and we added one more, one full more dimension in devising the, the universal discrete denoiser. We can also show the optimal performance guarantee of this algorithm. First, again, if we increase the window size, now slightly less than logarithmically in n, and for any, for all piecewise stationary process X, what do I mean by piecewise stationary? It means a process that has some stationary segments. And for all such piecewise stationary processes, again, the expected per symbol loss of stud is obtaining the best performance or the base optimal performance matched for that process, provided that the number of stationary segments is sublinear in N, meaning that it's not varying too fast. Again, for indiv individual sequence setting, for any underlying individual sequence x now, the per symbol loss of stud can attain the performance of dkm, which is the performance of a genie who knows both source and noisy sequence, and who can pick sliding window denoiser, and who have freedom to shift m times in a way to minimize the overall loss. Now, this shows that stud can attain performance of that best 
shifting sliding window denoisers, no matter what the underlying sequence is, only based on the noisy sequence, provided that the number of shifts, again, is sublinear in N. We also have a strong converse theorem saying that if the number of shifts is linear in N, then no denoiser in the world can attain this previous theorem. So this is a strong converse, meaning that if the shift is linear in N, stud cannot attain this previous theorem. No denoiser, any kind of denoiser. Any kind of denoiser. Yeah, not just sliding window. No, just any kind of denoiser. Okay. So any kind of, no denoiser can attain this previous theorem. That's why it's a strong converse. So this sublinear condition on the number of shifts is necessary and sufficient condition for these previous theorems to hold. And whenever this condition is true, stud can attain the performance guarantee. But that must be for the universal denoisers, right? Yeah, so. If you know the statistics, you could probably do it. Yes, yes, of course, of course. But the universal denoiser, which does not know about the source, but if the, the shift rate is linear in N, then no denoiser can do it. No universal denoiser can do it. So I don't have a time to go into the proof of these theorems, but I can give one simple reason why stud works. Basically, I assume that the channel is memoryless, and I design that this estimated loss is an unbiased estimate of true loss. Therefore, by some law of large number type of argument, the sum of estimated losses is going to be similar to the sum of the true loss, and minimizing this is going to be similar to minimizing this. Okay, so this is the main idea. And let's go back now to this example again. Again, we have a binary sequence coming from binary Markov chain where the parameter changes from point 0.01 to point 0.2 at the midpoint of the sequence. So the optimal performance in this case was attained by the four backer recursion, which knows everything about the source. Dude was not able to attain this performance. But the question is, can stud achieve this base optimal performance? And the answer is yes, as you can see, this blue curve is the error rate of the stud with, with m setting equal to 1. So if you give a freedom to choose this mapping to shift along the sequence, it successfully captures where it shifts, shifts and it gets close to the base optimal performance. Therefore, we can regard this m as another parameter in devising a universal discrete denoiser. So far, we have seen the stud algorithm, which is tailored for the one-dimensional case. Now let's see if we can extend this to the two-dimensional data case. But soon we can realize that extension is not trivial at all. Because in one-dimensional case, you just need to segment the data into distinct intervals, where in each interval you apply the fixed rule. But in two-dimensional case, it's not trivial how we can segment this data into homogeneous regions. That we apply the same rule in each region. So this extension is not trivial. But the extension of the dude to the two-dimensional case is straightforward because there you don't need to shift. You just apply the same fixed rule throughout the whole, whole sequence. So the extension to the, to the two-dimensional case is straightforward. But it's not the case for the stud. Now instead of going into the general scheme, we have a version of two-dimensional scheme of the stud. So we again look at the combination of mappings that can shift at most m times along the region, but we limit those regions to be those that can be get by this quad tree structured decomposition. So we set the number of regions equal to m, and we give freedom to these rules to shift along these m regions. And then we define the two-dimensional version of the stud in a similar way, meaning that minimize the estimated losses. Yes. I understand. So you, you were going to uh, go explore all possible um, trees tree structure with M nodes. Yes. Yes. With the number of leaves fixed. Yeah, a leaf, the number of leaves. Yeah. yeah. So we try to compete with this kind of shifting. Yes. So one question though is if you, there is a, to relate to the one dimensional case. Yes. So those blocks that are not rectangular like the one up there that all the three reds, right? Yes. That's a single block from the point of view of your coding. Yes. But it is not from the point of view of the the number of leaves. Yes. So so you couldn't you get uh you get into a sparse data problem that is you don't realize that 
the, 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 the the those three blocks are the same have the same com uh, should have the same rule. Yes. Yeah, so so I define in the one dimensional case also I I can have them to shift at most m time. So it doesn't have to shift every point of time. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, so this can be the same region. It it may not shift mm -hmm. the region or along this region. Yeah. So so. We define the two-dimensional version of stud in similar case, meaning that minimizing the estimated losses along these this regions. And we have the similar theorem saying that if m log m is now sublinear in, sequence, in the data size n, then again, the per symbol loss of two-dimensional stud is attaining this dkm almost surely with probability one for almost every noise realization sequence. Okay? So one question actually about this one and about the previous one. Yes. So what, what is the convergence rate on those? For this? For the, yeah, uh, also for the origin, for the okay. one-dimensional case. So for this expect, expectation result, right, for the? No, for this one. For this one. Yeah, for the so for this, for this one, it's, it's hard to get the uh, convergence rate because we, we proved this by using this borough cantelli lemma, which, which shows the uh, almost sure convergence. Mm -hmm. So it just shows that it is converging to this this limit with probability one, but it was hard to get the exact performance. But the but in practice, that's the most important thing is the conversion rate, right? not the yes, limit. Yes, of course, of course. Everything. But as is, as we see in the uh, in the example, it gets pretty close to the optimal for like sequence ten to the six, sequence like ten to the six, and so on. Yeah. So for for this uh, almost or with probability one convergence, it was hard to get the uh, convergence rate. But but for the expectation result, it was slightly it was like one over square root of n, yeah, mm -hmm. the convergence rate. So instead of going into the detail of this two-dimensional scheme, I just want to show an experimental result for images. Let's say now the clean image looks like this, which has different texture along the regions. Suppose it gets corrupted by noise. This is binary image, and bits are flipped with probability 0.1. This is the output of the stud algorithm, two-dimensional Stud algorithm, and this is the output of the dude algorithm, the original dude, which extended to the two-dimensional case. We can see our algorithm is doing much better job in getting this boundary or capturing this uh, different texture of the images. So here, it gets confused, but in stud, we get much, we do much better job. What's yes. m? Do you choose the optimal okay. m for each case? Okay. So m, so. I didn't mention this, but this, so for the scheme for this two-dimensional case, the, the optimal scheme that we deploy by minimizing this estimated loss has, it's not as simple as the one-dimensional case. The complexity for M is more expensive than the one-dimensional case, but we have a practical scheme, which again have the, which again have the linear complexity in sequence, the data size N and this number of regions. And that scheme, what it's doing is actually Builds a full tree, and then you try to uh, trim each leaves and get get the regions to employ. So this one started with the depth of four full tree, and then it 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 you know it trimmed the leaves and get the, get the region. So if we see the bit error rate for this these two schemes, we see the stud is always dominating, dude, for this kind of varying space varying images. So I have presented a new algorithm called STUD, which universally attained the optimal denoising performance on any sufficiently slowly varying sources. By sufficiently ver slowly, I mean the number of shift is sublinear in sequence length n. And I also have shown that if the source is varying too fast, no denoising, so STUD can no denoiser can do better than stud. That was another point. So what we learned is, by observing the noisy sequence long enough, we can figure out what the source is and how it varies. As a future work, we tried to find an application in the internet, for example, some text correction or book digitization. And we hope to find some connections to other areas which involves with the noisy observation and non-stationary probability loss. For example, in data compression or machine learning or information retrieval. So thank you very much.
on the time and space complexity of the solving the dynamic programming yes. problems, you showed they're proportional to n and m. Yes. But there's got to be some other interesting factors that have to do with the alphabet size, the number of contexts, yes, yes, yes. the number of mappings, and so on. So, so number of number of uh, contexts, it's the same because we're employing this parallel scheme for each context. Right, so that divides down that of the end. Yeah. 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 But, okay, so it also depends on the number of alphabets. I didn't say here, but essentially that's the number of these columns. So for binary case, there were four, four possible cases. So, so the... The number of this single letter mapping is actually z, the, the alphabet size of the noisy sequence, to the alphabet size of the reconstruction symbol. So in binary case, it's, it's 4, 2 to the 2. But, it, but it's fixed with the. Uh, so for any non trivial size alphabet, this, this could get prohibitively expensive. So uh, true for that case, but for binary case, it, it was simple. But, I mean, for a reasonable number, for example, four, I think it's fine. For for DNA sequences, mm -hmm. I think it's fine. Yeah. About letter sequences, have you got? For the text. Yeah. So, is it, is, so, can you make this practical for English text? So, so uh, I agree. For like 26 alphabet, it's going to be too much. So, um, yeah, so I should have to think more about getting practical algorithm for this text. So, uh, if I understand correctly, this is a single pass, right? Uh, they, what happens if you, what's the fixed point if you just iterate, like you keep running the algorithm over and over? You mean could, the could you do that? Single path? Oh, so, so I have, you, I have you a sequence and okay. I apply dude or stud or, and, and then, then do it I, again. I do it again and again and okay, again. Okay. So, what's the fixed point of that? What's the fixed point of this? Right. So, basically, this depends on the property, this, this channel is memoryless, independent over time, right? That was a key property that I was using. But if you process the, this dude to the output and get the reconstruction symbol, then this like memoryless noise is going to be uh, destroyed. So there was a there was an attempt that tried to get again like like a empirical memoryless noise between the noisy sequence and the reconstruction symbol <coughs> sequence and run this thing again. But, uh, so, but, okay, from this uh, theoretical result, at least for, you know, for piecewise stationary case, it is, is already attaining this uh, best performance that you can get from the base, base uh, scheme. But doing this iterative scheme, it may converge a little bit faster to this, but it will not, you know, it will not go below this, this optimal performance. Okay. So, but I, I'll have to experiment more on this iterative uh, employing. But I, I think it's, uh, it's really hard to prove something about it, but maybe in practice it can be helpful. Did you try on a two-dimensional noisy picture that is not conveniently perfectly divided as your scheme? Okay, yeah. So, so this was a model of, uh, for example, you're scanning a book. Some part is an image and some part is a text. But if we, if I run to the like more, more general images, then I, I could, I was able to observe that for small window size k. Still, still was doing much better than the dude, but for like larger, larger k, it was uh, sim giving a similar performance. So, for that case, I, I, but I, I will have to you know experiment more extensively to see how, how I can get the parameters and the things right to see the overall general uh, performance on this real image. But for generally, if it's if it's like uh, varying like space varying like images in the book and a text, then I think it will, it will still improve on dude. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much.